participant here. Uh, he's Keith Broom, and he's from the Department of Conservation. And his talk is Pest, Animals, and Native Islands, What Have We Learned? It's just uh, it's, it's more real estate for them to invade, right? We've got more peaceful <coughs> islands. Uh, and some of them are rather too close to islands that still have peace on them when you begin to understand the swimming range of uh, these critters. Uh, and some of these islands are open to uh, public visitation and uh, hundreds and sometimes thousands or hundreds of thousands of people visiting. So it's quite a challenge. Um, we do see incidences of uh, beating our garden down too and having a lot of quarantine. Um, so what have we learned along the way? Well, one thing we're learning is just how far these things can swim. Uh, this is quite a neat paper um, by Andrew Beal, which, um, you know, we, on, on the swimming range of stokes, and we used to think that stokes were good for about a, thousand meters, maybe a mile, but um, here we've got pretty strong evidence that they'll go three kilometers and um, some say even five. And what do animals do when they arrive on pest-free islands with the ecology of those islands? Um, there are other studies that follow this and, and this is kind of typical of, of what happened. Uh, Raz are there, um, the, uh, it caused quite a bit of consternation so uh, he's quite hard to catch, and, and he uh, uh, hopped over to the island next door across 400 metres of open sea. Um, and that caused uh, a little bit of a ruckus in the media back home, and um, culminated in a, a well-known New Zealand author writing a children's book about Brazil. <laughs> uh, Sonny didn't really enter into the spirit of the experiment. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, if, you, if you look at the patterns, uh, there's, uh, there's quite a few there which uh, they, they had a sort of exploratory phase when they first, soon after they first arrived, um, before settling down. And this has led us to think that um, our detection devices and our surveillance can be relatively widespread and still, still pick up um, these critters when they arrive. Um, but for me, the the underlying uh, take home message here is one of individual variability. And that is that you can, uh, you can know what uh, the average rat will do, but you don't know what the particular rat that arrives on your island or the next one is going to do, and you have to cope with that, with that individual variability. Uh, for a, quite a while now, we've been. Um, using uh, population genetics to give us a steer on um, how, uh, the, uh, how isolated 
why they desire in terms of reinvasion. And I guess you're familiar with the story where uh, if you've got uh, if rats are relatively closely related from different islands, uh, you, you need to treat those as one eradication unit. Um, whereas if you're a little more isolated and they, they sort of stick out on your uh, family tree there, then um, perhaps you can get away with just doing that one. But I, I really want to draw your attention to this uh, paper by Sarah Brayton and colleagues um, that came out uh, last year. And uh, they suggest that we may have been a bit optimistic in our interpretation of that genetic data. And one of uh, their study sites was on Pearl Island. That's not actually Pearl Island, you see there, that's Stewart Island, which is uh, our third largest island in New Zealand in, in the south of the country. Um, and Pearl Island is um, just this little 400 hectare island just on the south coast there. And so uh, we did the normal thing and looked at the genetics of, uh, of the island and found quite a uh, good distinctiveness between Pearl Island and uh, rats on Stewart Island. So we went ahead and eradicated the, the rats from Pearl Island in 2005 and we were fairly confident we did that. Uh, but they came straight back from, from Stewart Island. And uh, their explanation for this trying to go along with it is that uh, the resident rats uh, formed a, a kind of a resistance to um, the establishment of uh, the, uh, the, the ones next door from um, really getting established and showing up in the, in the gene pool. Um, and so when you uh, eradicate those rats, you take away those locals, uh, then you, you more or less open the door um, for reinvasion. Kind of like the history of the new world, really, isn't it? Uh, here's another interesting study. This is uh, Helen Nathan and, and uh, uh, supervisors. And um, what Helen did was take uh, mother mouse and father mouse and put them uh, at either end of this um, uh, little island here, six hectares, and see what happens. And um, Predictably, they found each other, and well, they had lots of sex. And uh, uh, they they filled the island. They, they reached peak density within five months, which is pretty scary. Uh, their movements, a bit like uh, what James found, was uh, their movements were quite wide um, to start with, but um, began to shrink as uh, density increased. Uh, increased. And um, they also took the opportunity to. Um, check out the, the current sort of methods that we use for detecting mites on islands uh, and to see how they work at those low densities and um, uh, mercifully the answer was not too bad. I also learned to um, expect to be, uh, expect the unexpected I guess and uh, here's a couple of examples. Um, uh, these guys went out fishing and uh, had a pig swimming around way offshore um, so they Went out to a snapper and came back with a cork. Um, and then uh, this cat uh, was discovered on a, on a pest free island. And when we backtracked the story, um, apparently it had fallen off a boat some months before. And uh, they'd been roaming around this island completely undetected um, for several months. So. And, uh, this guy is uh, a brush tailed possum on a log looking rather sorry for himself. <laughs> and uh, the real surprise here is where it was. Uh, that picture was taken uh, within 60 meters of one of our most iconic peace uh, free um, island sanctuaries. And that, um, that red dotted line is just my guess of um, uh, how he got there on the, on the currents coming down the river. And then stowaways uh, have their own kind of stories. This is uh, a rat's nest in an outboard motor. Um, just a few straws um, noticeable there, but uh, quite a lot of nesting material. Quite a clean shed too. So what are we doing about uh, all this? Well, uh, 
there, there are lots of opportunities when you're visiting islands to uh, intercept critters. And while we, we still have to um, uh, have that uh, capability of um, dealing with the things that reach the islands, uh, there's a lot more scope to, um, to work back up that uh, defense at the top of the cliff, if you like, instead of the expensive uh, ambulance at the bottom. One of the um, real challenges in this is uh, how we reach people and get them to do the right thing. And uh, uh, we need to find those, those uh, messages that uh, uh, really resonate with them and, and get that change in behaviour. And I think there's a, a role here for social marketing research. We're, we're just getting into that, but um, uh, we've got a long way to go there. However, where you've got um, well-dressed, good-looking and well-informed staff uh, providing that message, um, it, it is well-received and um, having a friend like Flynn here to hold the leash with our well-dressed staff member is, um, is a bonus as well. We really um, I think we've got a great tool in these uh, detection dogs um, and we want to uh, expand our um, program and get them um, more involved in that quarantine uh, end of the uh, spectrum as well. Uh, top left here is um, Brian Shields and his uh, uh, ant detecting, Argentine ant detecting dog, um, which is a Welsh spaniel named Rhys Jones. Um, what else would you name a Welsh spaniel? <laughs> Glenn Davis or something. Like that. Uh, we want to improve our uh, quarantine stores um, within the department to um, allow our staff to uh, operate efficiently but also um, give good protection to the islands that we're visiting. And uh, another um, thing about efficiency is um, for our incursion response where we expect to get um, uh, critters, we, we like to have some hardware out there all, all ready to go. Um, in this case we've got a Track box that will um, uh, take rats uh, or stoats. Uh, there's a footprint tracking tunnel there and the mouse trap. And we're looking at uh, kind of innovations there as well. Um, here's a, an example of the kind of a multi purpose uh, uh, box where it's convertible from a, um, a tracking tunnel to a track box or even a bait station. And then just on the horizon for us is uh, some new technology which is looking at um, uh, footprint recognition, electronic footprint recognition, which may replace mm -hmm. our um, active tracking cards. Um, and uh, the hope is that if these kids won't work, then uh, you know, they may recognize a rat that's run through a tunnel and send a text or something on the GRP. Um, so, just to wrap up, I think in New Zealand we've had this kind of wild ride of success of, over the last 30 years with eradications, but uh, we really um, need to get on top of this biosecurity thing before we go forward on the, um, the, the large and tough islands that um, remain for us. And um, the, the real nub of this is uh, figuring out how to uh, get um, all island visitors involved in, in um, doing the right thing. This is a bit of an old saying, but uh, really there's no uh, greater um, value um, that the effort that goes into the island by security. Um, it's, it's really a small price to pay for the, the great value that we 